Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Established in 2017, Goodman's creates sustainable investment solutions for advice professionals and retail customers, focusing on tools that help customers engage with sustainable and responsible investing. The goal is to play a key role in redirecting capital to environmentally sustainable, socially responsible, and ethical business. The Goodman's Advisor Portal is a discovery, analytics, research, and advice support tool designed to give advisors the confidence to determine their clients' responsible investment needs, analyze portfolio holdings, and access institutional-grade environmental, social, and governance research for over 7,000 global equities, ETFs, and funds. G'day, Clayton here from XY Advisor. Um, Today, as a part of our ethical investment series, uh, I've got the pleasure of chatting with Marco from Sustainalytics today. Now, Marco, someone, uh, you know, I sort of put the call out to my network and said, I I really want to interview some experts in this area. Um, And Marco is nice enough to give us some of his time today. So, mate, thanks so much for coming on. Happy to be here, Clayton. Thanks for the time. Oh, of course. All right. Well, um, so let's kind of maybe start at the basics because this sort of five part series is all about how to get financial advisors from not knowing much or anything about, fin- uh, sorry, uh, ethical investments up to a point where if a client walks into their door, they can handle conversations, their, their, their ability to be able to maybe start advising on this topic. Um, that's kind of the goal of this series. So, uh, what would you consider uh, to be the definition of responsible investing? So that's, that's a good first question. So I think that responsible invest in, investment is a term that's um, referred has a you know referred in a wide spectrum uh, way. So it's effectively looking at um, responsible in, in investment beyond uh, looking exclusively at financial returns. So recognizing that investments actually have uh, can have both positive and negative uh, impacts on people and uh, the environment. Um, I think what's important to flag about responsible investment is, is that there are also other terms that are used uh, or can be used interchangeably depending on who you're speaking with, uh, such as um, you know ethical investing or socially responsible investing or uh, impact investing. Um, and I thought I'd maybe highlight what the, you know, at a very broad level, what the key differences are yeah. and then how these are applied um, across the industry. Yep. Um, so, you know, ethical investing um, is effectively looking at um, investing based on a broad set of beliefs and values. So looking at really what, what people believe in and using that as, as the determinant to, to, uh, make investment decisions. Uh, the next one, which I'd say, you know, broadly encompasses responsible investment is the, uh, you know, an approach that's more broadly integrates social, environmental and corporate governance factors into decision making processes. Um, and lastly, uh, impact investing, which actually l- looks at proactively having positive contributions uh, to you know people and environments looking at things like affordable housing or renewable energy so I think broadly speaking that's how it's defined um, and, right. and yeah I'll, I'll turn back to you um, NDIS so uh, NDIS National Disability Invest uh, Insurance Scheme um, I know something you know the, the way that you were just talking about it just then um, I know that there's an investment mandate that's coming out shortly that says, okay, because uh, the government is uh, creating this national disability housing and paying the rent essentially for people with disabilities, uh, there's a guaranteed, guaranteed, you know, government backed uh, income to be received from um, as rent uh, from properties that have been sort of fitted out and kitted 
as uh, as being able to handle people, you know, with disabilities. So I guess I guess my question is, some an investment like that because it's government backed, um, you can kind of uh, sort of earn decent income, right? Um, there's lower risk. There's a there's locked in tenants being the government. And then because it does something, let's call it nice, right? So because uh, your investments are housing people with disabilities, does, does this fit into a definition of socially conscious investments or like, is it, is it just, is it, does it just need to serve some social good? Um, look, I think broadly speaking, yes, uh, it really depends on, on the investor that uh, you have this conversation with. Um, but I think that the, the key takeaway from, from impact investing is that there is a proactive um, intention to actually have positive contributions. So, you know, affordable housing is just one example, but we can also look at, you know, green buildings or green infrastructure or renewable energy or, um, energy efficiency, electric vehicles. So, you know, there are, there are major uh, trends um, or, or major themes that can be uh, used as a, as a vehicle or as a channel to actually de- deliver um, positive uh, contributions or, or impact. Uh, an- another one that comes to mind is, um, you know, they, it's called sustainable finance. So providing financial services to underserviced uh, communities. So look, there's, there's many ways that this can be approached. And um, I think that the, the key takeaway, and I think we'll probably discuss this later on is uh, having a conversation that's, that means something to the client uh, and the person who's in front of you and understanding what's, what really floats their boat, what really ticks them uh, and drives them um, and then guiding them towards that direction. Um. Well, let's jump into that then, because if so, would you say that there are, um, let's call it levels to uh, ethical investment, you know, responsible investing? Um, So let's say, you know, because this is relatively new, um, I'm sure that there are going to be people that focus on this a lot, but it's going to be probably a maybe a lot more uh, surface versions of, of ethical investments. Let's say I'm someone that wants to do good with my money, but I don't really want to dive into anything specifically. So uh, let's say you're the financial planner and I walk in as a client and I say, look, I just want a certain portion of my portfolio to make sure that the results from the investments are doing good in the world. How the hell do you respond as a financial advisor to that? Well, I think, um, firstly, I'm not a financial. (laughs) (laughs) Sure. But I think there's some, some basic steps to really understanding what ticks your clients and, you know, if if I, if you come to me and say I want to do good and uh, some form of good, you know, there is there is you basically have a, a blank canvas to work with. Mm. So I think s- s- the first step is to ask the basic questions. So ask your client what they what matters to them. Um, do they care about environmental causes? Do they care about social causes? What's important to them? Um, basic questions like you know, do they consider the um, type of companies that they buy goods and services from and their social or, or environmental reputation? That's um, a good question. Right. So you, you can basically, <clears throat> that, that's even a good litmus test, hey? So that, that might even be a good introductory question to, to say, do you purchase in your day-to-day life any goods or services, or do you avoid any companies in your day-to-day life that, uh, like from an ethical point of view? So that even might be a cool little 
uh, way to sort of broach the situation um, or, or the concept in an easy to understand fashion because the last thing you want to do as a financial planner is make it more complicated for your client. Like you don't want, so it's kind of like a client comes in and you're getting to know everything about them because the advice process is literally, you know, this person walks in with dreams and goals and aspirations and dollar figures in their head and expenses on a day-to-day basis. And they've got assets here and sort of complicated uh, financial life. And then the goal of the financial planner is to literally figure all of that out, which takes a while, then educate them as to, uh, you know, what are, from their point of view and in their situation, what are high level, the best sort of immediate steps to take, intermediate steps to take and long-term steps to take. So in amongst all of this you know, you could call it a maelstrom of information of back and forth. The last thing that you want to do is complicate it by adding in sort of something left to field. Um, and so I think that's kind of been one of the reasons of hesitation with broaching this subject because you're going through something so significant and personal to the individual that's sitting in front of you that it almost seems a little bit rude to put onto them an additional layer of uh, hurdles or requirements for them to start thinking about rather than just simply what's the best thing for them because that's kind of the point of financial advice. However, I kind of dig that question that you've just put in because that way you can kind of gauge where the individual is at without sort of scaring them and putting them in a mindset of something else to think about and a complication. So if perhaps during your fact finding process that if you ask the question, are you avoiding or do you purposely purchase from any companies because of any ethical reasons, that I feel is actually a really good tip or entry into whether you should broach this subject with someone or not. So I think that's a really cool question. Yeah, look, and, and I totally agree. And what, what you've uh, noted you know, clearly hits the mark, which is you don't, you don't want to make this conversation more complex than it needs to be. It's all about asking really simple questions. And you know, there's a term that's been uh, thrown around these days a bit, which is, um, you know, financial coaching, because these conversations effectively uh, tend to be more of a coaching process rather than a yeah. um, specific advising. Um, and I think this is where asking these very simple questions not only enable you to to discover what matters to the client, but also engage with them on issues that really matter uh, and that results in two things. One gives you better information to help them meet their goals, but two also creates, uh, you know, much uh, stickier relationship, uh, in connection with that client. Yeah. Because I think, I think probably making sure that you're broaching this subject with the right client is really important to that client. And if it's not important to them, then you're kind of putting a blockage or another hurdle in the way. So, man, uh, yeah, like, again, I, I'm a big fan now as of this conversation of asking that question, which is, you know, w- like, what are you already doing in this space? Like if someone's, say, for example, avoiding caged eggs in Woolworths, right, and then maybe your question is not specifically, do you avoid caged eggs? It, it's worse. But like, you know, if, if you're framing a question along those lines, the socially conscious people are going to, to know what they already consider. Um, and the people that aren't thinking about it, then you're not sort of forced to then have to explain something in addition. And also like, it's a little bit rude as well. Like if I, if you come into my office and let's say in this example, you don't care about caged eggs, right? And I, and I sit there and I go, hey, uh, do you want me to tell you about ethical investments? 
And you go, no. And then there's going to be like a half a second of awkward silence where we both have to sit there and examine that you're not socially conscious and you're examining that as, as that conversation goes on. And I'm sitting there and you'll probably think I'm judging you. And it's sort of a weird scenario. Um, and, and again, as an advisor, that's not your job. Like your, your job isn't to sort of pressure in any way someone to, to become, you know, to, to fall into a certain ethical framework. Um, but I think, you know, having a question potentially in the fact fine or potentially you just bring it up in casual conversation. Yeah. Where it's, where it's like, you know, did, did, have you avoided a, a home loan from a bank because they loaned money to, you know, the, the oil companies that were dredging up the, uh, the, the, the great barrier reef, you know, like I think, I think somehow if you can ask a question where it's, super day to day and it doesn't need to immediately reflect who they are as a person, but just gives you a shortcut um, into whether you should broach the topic or not. Yeah. I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big fan. Do you have any other cool ways to sort of ask simple questions that sort of lead to bigger conversations? Um, well, I mean, uh, the thing is that that's tricky is that as you say, in this discovery process, the advisor should know their clients. So, you know, age, aspirations, family, what they're what they want to achieve and and these these facts should enable asking questions about for example do you have young kids do you aspire for them to go to university so is education something important to you um is access to education something that's worthwhile or is someone sick in the family is health something that's important to you um simple ones like uh is is waste or, or ocean pollution um something that matters to you uh sustainable, uh, you know, um, fisheries, which that might be a bit more complex, but yeah. it's, it's all a matter of um, being able to engage the client in, in a way that, you know, only the advisor is going to know in that particular moment, but using the, the life settings um, and objectives that the client is putting on the table as, as those um, channels to engage in that different conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, like, obviously, I've put you in a little bit of a difficult position because I'm asking you as an advisor and, you know, clearly you, you, that, that's not your background, but I really do appreciate sort of um, being able to hit you with a couple of these questions because, uh, yeah, like uh, the, the answers, I guess, from an advisor point of view is super important. Uh, important. So um, let's kind of maybe swap into um, technology, Right. So is there, is there any kind of tech um, that you're finding helps with, uh, with any of this, this, you know, is, is it robo or, or is there anything out there that any tools that you're finding that um, can help advisors assist clients in this way? Um, so, so look, I think in terms of what's there for advisors to use, there's two sides to to what's available. One is research and I think that's critical. And then there's tools. So if I, um, you know, very brief pointed response to, to what research is available. I think the responsible investment association of, of Australasia, RIA has some, uh, very good tools that advisors can use. Um, there's actually a, um, a financial advisor guide, which is quite a straightforward, uh, document that, you know, is provide some research, but it's mostly about tools that that advisors can can use. Um, RIA has actually also created a. It's called the Responsible Returns Web Tool, which actually is quite a quite a um, a useful tool that enables advisors to search uh, for um, certified RIA certified um, funds. Right. And, and the searches can be done based on uh, what clients are interested in. That could be you know, renewable energy or um, energy efficiency, whatever that may be, and what clients are also not interested in uh, investing in. So um, screening out funds that invest in, for example, fossil fuels or tobacco or, or the like. Um, so I, I'd probably start there. Um, Morningstar has uh, some, some good publicly available research and, um, what's interesting about Morningstar is they've, they've recently been producing 
some research based on um, you know behavioral science and looking at uh, whether there's any um, age or gender biases towards responsible investment and you know effectively I, I might save you the reading and let you know that <laughs> they've proven that it's beyond uh, uh, you know th there's no age and gender bias in terms of you know whether it's millennials or women only interest right. in, in responsible investment and they've basically concluded that there's interest across uh, the board so um, that's oh. still quite interesting to, to support you know that's fantastic well as an aging male it's good to know I'm gonna have a heart still <laughs> <laughs> um, and look and the last one is uh, the UN uh, principles for responsible investment uh, there's a lot of research there uh, guidelines, thematic pieces. So um, I probably once have going through the RIA and Morningstar stuff, I, I'd probably go there if, if I'm interested in delving into particular issues that were important to my clients. Uh, right, right. So the UN has sort of put together what they see as their sort of the international standard, I guess. Is that is that kind of where that's headed? Um, look, not really an international standard, but, but more so um, a framework and then, you know, underlying research pieces that contribute to, to the framework. So they look at how um, responsible investments or ESG is applied um, across different asset classes, uh, you know, equities, fixed income, private equity. So, you know, there's a lot of in-depth research um, that may or may not be relevant to uh, all advisors, but if there is a need to access, um, you know, more granular information, thematic pieces on, you know, ocean, ocean waste or right. seafood or the like, there's a lot of information there that could be useful. Um, so talk to us a little bit about this sort of the empty promises of, of ESG and the, or, or, or what I've heard being called greenwashing. So what, what's going on? What is this? Um, so, sorry, um, I just thought it'd be useful to finish the response because I went through the research part of what's there for advisors, but there's actual, yeah. uh, there's tools that I think would be important as well. So, uh, sustainability obviously uh, provides research. So, yep. uh, we would work with, um, larger dealer groups or wealth management firms. So if that's the case working directly with a provider like Sustainalytics yep. or other providers might be the best solution. Um, having said that, we also recognize that, uh, Sustainalytics recognizes that our clients need to access research in different forms. So we actually work with um, other uh, data platforms. So, you know, our data is publicly available via Yahoo Finance. So, you know, if you're interested in a company, you could go in there, search oh, it, wow. see it's... Uh, environmental, social, co corporate governance performance, have a bit of a high level visibility as to whether the company has been involved in controversies, see their track record and whether they're involved in any, um, you know, business activities, which uh, you might not be comfortable investing in like, you know, gambling or tobacco. Or oh, oh, what do you mean about controversies? Um, so effectively w we undertake research on companies involvement in controversies yeah what what yeah like what kind of controversies <laughs> so it can be any kind of controversies effectively the way that we approach it is um looking at what are the issues that are material to a company so you know if we're looking at uh, a mining company the issues are very different to a bank uh, right. to a retailer so right we're looking at uh what's material for that particular company and then whether there's any controversies in 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 their operations, effectively, that would might that might flag a discrepancy between what the company says it's doing and what it actually is doing in practice. So, right. you know, controversies that we would pick up, for example, in in Australia, following the Royal Commission, yeah. uh, you know, there's there's been uh, a lot of uh, business ethics controversies from the from the banks. Um, the you know the the Volkswagen diesel gate uh, was picked up as a controversy, which was the the emissions thing, right? Yeah, the emission emission uh, scandal. So mm. these are the types of controversies that we pick up, and and obviously I'm I'm sharing the most significant and well known, but we yeah. pick up you know 
smaller controversies that you might not read on in, in the newspaper. Right. That's super interesting. So let's say 2017 Uber, for example. So if I, if I was to look at the research done on Uber, it would go into a bit more detail around the controversies that they were involved in. Yeah, that's correct. So there would be an assessment um, on the, uh, you know, the severity, the significance, the impact. Um, yeah. So. Wow. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's something else that could be asked as part of, um, you know, the fact finding um, process, which is, um, are, are there, are there issues that you've seen occur, you know, in the market that's are really against what you believe in, you know, so are you uh, uncomfortable or are you totally against, um, you know, financial institutions charging uh, unfair fees um, you know, obviously there's, there's a connection to the business ethics controversy. Yeah. So, you know, the, these are also ways to ask the question that might enable you to say, okay, well, we don't want to, uh, invest in companies with certain severity of controversy, or we don't want to invest in companies that uh, are part of a particular sector, which we're against. So, yeah. you know, there's a positive side, there's a neg- there's a positive conversation, but also there's a, there's a no go conversation that could be held as well. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm just trying to like, so it, it, in, in a way, like the research, especially around what we're talking about now is things go in and out of the newspapers or, or, or let's call it Twitter. Right. So, you know, it's something has a two week cycle. So you could be the, the darling of the world or the, the devil of the world for two weeks. And then, you know, as they say, everyone forgets, but uh, sustainalytics in this, in this case would register that on a permanent record, so to speak. Um, look, we could call it conceptually a permanent record. Um, there's a methodology behind it. And effectively, if let's say the controversy is managed perfectly from the moment that it occurs, it's possible that three years later it might not be in, in the company's oh, wow. record. Having okay, said cool. that, having said that, if the, you know, for controversies which are really severe, so, you know, thinking about Volkswagen diesel gates, yeah. for example, um, they're still facing litigation. I think I read in the newspaper today that they just settled the class action uh, in Australia. So, you know, that happened four years ago and litigation and fines are wow. still occurring. So, you know, for those levels of controversies and severity, they would still be part of, of our research. Yeah, wow. And, and I think something else to notice is that not only, I mean, Yahoo Finance is, is, um, is available there for free. Um, something that's uh, maybe a lot of listeners would, be, would find useful is that our research is actually also used by Morningstar. So uh, oh. Morningstar actually... Um, ESG uh, methodology and um, our company level research is then aggregated to a fund level uh, rating. So that's, you know, applied by Morningstar in their sustainability rating and uh, for over 20,000 funds globally. So, um, Oh, wow. So you guys give a fund a rating. Well, Morningstar gives a fund the rating using our underlying right. methodology at a company level. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, so, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that there's, there's a lot of your, uh, of your listeners and, and members that uh, use Morningstar, so I thought that would be useful. Yeah. Um, our research is also integrated into platforms like BT Panorama, um, which also uh, wow. provide both company level and fund level uh, ESG information. Um, wow. and, and one last that I, that I thought I'd share and... Nice. Um, you know, you asked initially about some robo advisory. So this is yeah, this is where this came from. Um, and this is not robo advisory, but um, Goodmint, which is quite an interesting platform, um, as they're actually working on an advisor tool. And what's important, or what's very interesting about their advisor tool, is that it's actually um, it's a tool. It's not necessarily research, research driven. Um, it's mm. a tool that enables um, advisors to make value-adjusted decisions uh, based on invest on, on their clients' um, investment uh, parameters. Yeah. Um, so that they can literally, you know, tweak the 
Voltage. Yeah, the, the to, I, I know Tom, um, and yeah, that that's a really interesting product from my point of view because one of the problems with ethical is that it is different for everyone, right? And then how do you solve the problem of ethical specialization? So yeah, that 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 in particular has been pretty pretty impressive to me. Um, yeah, man. Like, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan. I, I haven't invested any money through them yet, but, uh, I'm, I'm certainly a fan of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm a big fan as well. Um, at, at a personal level, I think it's a pretty, pretty powerful tool. Yeah, definitely. Um, so how do we look at this? Just be, I, I just want to sort of figure this out. So greenwashing, what is greenwashing? Cause it's a horrible word. <laughs> like whoever came up with it definitely came from finance because finance as a lexicon for an industry has some of the worst uh, terminology imaginable. And so I saw this sort of greenwashing. I was like, okay, I got to find out what this is. Um, look, the reality is that um, the sustainability has has been around for, as in the term sustainability has been around for 30, 40 years. Right. Um, however, during the early days of sustainability, and this is more, more apl- applied broadly across industries, not just finance, um, businesses started to pick up on the fact that there, there were very strong consumer behavioral patterns that required them to be more sustainable and um, responsible in how they produce uh, their goods and services. Right. Um, and in this, you know, while some companies did very well in actually changing the way that they did business, other companies um, effectively started to, you know, kind of false advertise and false market what they were doing and how they were doing it. Um, and that's how the term greenwashing was created and financial services. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a similar thing where, you know, there's some funds that um, claim to be um, sustainable, but there's no effective uh, or real process, uh, sustainability process or data uh, behind it. So, yeah, right. So it's like, I mean, they're being fraudulent in, in a way. Look, yeah, that's that's a strong word. I, I'm I'm sure that um, they've they've sought legal advice before they put this on a right, right, <laughs> right. No, 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 no. Fair enough. Um, so would would an example of that be clean coal? I've heard that term before, clean coal, and I was like, oh, okay. Were they wash it before? <laughs> it's clean coal. Look, I think. Um, you know, it's tricky when we get into specific examples. Um, sure. I think that's, you know, I mean, call, call is an easy one and, and it's it's been in the, um, I guess, crossfires recently and, you know, fossil fuels are becoming, um, you know, as, as, a, as a sector is bec- becoming, uh, there's increasing pressure. Mm. Um, not only from consumers, but by governments and also by competing technologies. Um, so, look, that's that's a, a, a relatively good example. Um, but yeah, look, I think that's the. I think the key point of of greenwashing is not necessarily the greenwashing itself, but for advisors to understand. Um, what is actual, you know, what sits under a um, responsible investment strategy um, and how is it being done and then how they can use that information about a specific product or fund to have a conversation with their clients. So I think that's what the most important point about this uh, is. Awesome, man. Well, thanks like so much for coming on. Um, I'm learning heaps in, in this, uh, in this process. Um, mate, for anyone that wants to reach out to you or to sustain uh, learn more, you know, it, how, how do they get in contact? Uh, look, they can, you know, they can send, send an email to, um, 
to our general email. I think our, the, the link is in our website. Um, if they want to reach out personally, I'm happy to, to have a conversation or to, you know, to provide any guidance that's, that's possible. We, this is what we do for a living. So more than happy to, to help drive that change and, and equip uh, listeners with uh, the tools that they need. So if they want to contact me personally, it's uh, marco.sepulveda at sustainalytics.com. My last name is not the easiest, so I'm hoping you're going to write that one down. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, legend, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate your time. And also that sort of the, you know, taking a bit of effort as well before having our conversation, like you, you wanted to learn a little bit about X, Y and what we were about. And, you know, I just thank, thanks for um, caring and, and, you know, wanting to contribute. So, yeah, appreciate it. Not a problem with I'm happy to help and uh, look forward to further collaboration in the future. Awesome, man. Cheers. Thanks, mate. Talk soon.